This is Paul Burnett interviewing Betty Gibbs for the Global Mining and Materials Research Project of the Business Series of the Oral History Center of the Bancroft Library. And uh, we're here in Denver, Denver, Colorado at the Convention Center. It's February 18th, 2015. So you're working from 1973 to 1976 for, for Climax or the Molybdenum yeah. Company <laughs> as a senior mining engineer. Yeah. Uh, I guess, it, did you start as a senior mining engineer? Or? No, I started as an engineer. Yeah. Uh, uh, undergrad three, engineer. Three, I think. I okay. think it was three, two, one. Okay. But, and then I moved up to a two. Um, but I don't think I was a senior mining engineer until I went to work for Gulf Mineral Resources. Okay. okay. Uh, and so how did that transition happen? Well, um, I decided that I needed a change, <laughs> and so I, I knew somebody, oh yeah, when I was in school I used to go to local section, you know, AIME section meetings, mm -hmm. so I had some contacts there, so so I called up this one guy I knew and I said, well, I'm thinking really about leaving Climax, or I might have seen him at a CMA conference or something. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about leaving Climax. Do you have any ideas? So he sent me to this guy at Gulf Mineral Resources, and pretty soon I had a job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the face-to-face -face networking of, of AIME and uh, yeah, 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 right, and you know, it's recommendations from somebody yeah. or knowing somebody. Those have always been the best way to get jobs. Yeah, yeah. I, I mm. ask people, you know, so how did you find out about this job? Friend of mine. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good right. Answer always. Oh, friend uh, of mine. Met yeah. them at the meeting, and mm -hmm. and so it's, this is a. It, it's I, a I, great networking it, opportunity. It is. Yeah. It does sound like it, even to this day. I mean. Oh yeah. It's right. hard to believe now with like eight thousand people coming to a conference. That sounds a bit intimidating, but people. It's an opportunity for people, old friends to meet, and oh, yeah. old contacts to meet, yeah. new contacts to be developed. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, at Gulf Mineral Resources. Uh, you, you, the title is Senior Mining Engineer now, mm -hmm. and Application Analyst. Oh, well, what I was doing was, uh, and that's another interesting story, mm -hmm. techn technological-wise, mm -hmm. because they had had someone there who was doing, quote, operations research right. sort of stuff, which is like a big overall thing, and... and uh, this first project I worked on there was on the Crow Indian Reservation, and, and you know this operations research guy had done this computer work and said, "Oh, there's like three billion tons of coal under there," and and in the I guess it was it was Mineral Resources Department or something. Mm -hmm. um, there were some people that were a little bit skeptical of that because. Um, you know, it was just too much. Yeah. It was, uh, it didn't commitment. seem, yeah, it was high level sort of stuff. And those operations research stuff kind of started in the 60s. Yeah. And, um, and that seemed, and it was like, this is the answer to everything. And, you know, like, this can be mine. It has an overall uh, stripping ratio of like two to one, no problem, blah, blah, blah. We can mine three million tons of coal or three billion tons of coal and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And some of the people there were kind of skeptical. So, so I was kind of given the, the job of saying, well, is this realistic? And, mm -hmm. and basically I discovered that it wasn't very realistic. <laughs> And not only that, the crows wanted a, a huge royalty, and it just would not have been economic. So, mm -hmm. so that's kind of what moved me more into the computer uh, resource calculation mm -hmm. thing. And we were doing it on, um, well, we did have mainframes, that, but the mainframes were in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. so it was a little bit awkward. But... Uh, Oh, yeah, I forgot. While I was in graduate school, I worked for Conoco Minerals mm -hmm. doing, uh, I, I wrote a program to do open pit design. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, like I, I calculated the, the resource and then did an open pit design. And I, so I was doing some Fortran programming at that time to do that. So this kind of carried on 
into Gulf Minerals and mm -hmm. and um, and what I what I kind of got going there mm -hmm. was I, and again I was having to fight this perception that oh we can't do things on computer right. uh, you know it doesn't really answer everything but can you talk a little bit about resistance to computing? In, yeah. in the mining industry, yeah, and, and where does that come from, and and what well, what were their fears, and it, uh, is was any was there anything justified in there? Had they had bad experiences with some? Some did, yeah. and some of it was from from people who were saying, "Oh, we can do everything. We right. can solve all your problems with it, with this computer program." Right. And so they got, sorry, they got kind of a bad taste in their mouth about computing. So when I moved into uh, Gulf Minerals, they had a pretty bad taste. And I kept saying, oh, we can do these things on computer. There's this company, Mintech, that has these programs. And you know, um, Climax, or Amax at that time, was starting to use them. And you know, we can do it. And they would say, yeah, but you know, there's this, the geological part is, is more of an art. And, um, and, you know, the geologist does this design. We can't reproduce that on computer. And, mm. and so kind of what I ended up doing say, is saying, no, you can't reproduce that on computer. But you can take what they're doing and use the computer to do all, a lot of the calculations that people used to have to sit, there, sit around with a little calculator or with their slide rules right. and, and do those calculations. Yeah. But we can do that part on the computer, and the geologist needs to interface. You know, the geologist needs to do their work, mm -hmm. and we can take that and put it into a program. And this is exactly what's happening these days. Mm -hmm. But back then, you know, there was, uh, oh, a computer can't do a contour map that we could accept. Right. And um, and there's certainly and there is still uh, you know some caution about that. Yeah. That just because you can do all of these fancy stuff with the computer doesn't mean it's has anything to do with reality. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so and that's kind of hard for these kids, I think, because you know they they tend to get over de overly dependent on what the computer is doing. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, it's like, and it was back, same thing back then, too. It was like, well, if the computer put it, puts it out, it must be the right thing. Right, but right. there were still a lot of skeptics at that time yeah. that said, no, just because the computer drew it, or, you know, I don't even trust what the computer does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now it's, you know, now it's sort of the other way. People tend to kind of think, Oh, the computer did it. That must be right. It's an automatic, uh, and it's hard to say. Maybe so. Maybe not. Right. So this is some of the training that I've done with a friend of mine, and we've done quite a bit of training on what's reality about yeah. contouring, and um, you know, what kind of trouble can you get into yeah. if you don't do things right. Right. And, and the the so. term in science <laughs> studies is technological progressivism. Mm. It's a blind faith mm -hmm. in technology, just assuming that, oh, yeah, computers, it's good, going to be better because it's mm -hmm. high technology. It will result in a better outcome without any engagement in, you know, well, part of it might be better, but it might be worse in some respects, and we still need to tweak it, and mm -hmm. uh, we still need to do certain kinds of real-time or uh, real interface yeah. with, with, uh, yeah. with testing the actual, you know, the actual mine site. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's that's a challenge in education these days. Right. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's uh, critical thinking. So. Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's something that you can only really learn by experience. Yeah. 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 You can try and teach by examples, but unless they yeah. encounter it, it's, it's difficult. Right. Um, so, and I was going back to your first example of the open pit. Um, Design mm -hmm. the first one. Mm -hmm. um, were you uh, 
you're starting with the, the measured or ent uh, expected um, deposit. With drill hole, with drill hole data. Drill hole data. Starting with drill hole data. And then, uh, and so you'd have a certain number of variables in your, in your, in your program uh, that you could input, and you'd input these variables. So it was to kind of semi-automate <laughs> some of the process of, of pit design? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's more yeah. complicated than that, but I was just trying well, to get a sense of, uh, you know, what what you could do with what what Fortran programming was useful for mm -hmm. at that time. Um, uh, you well, know, at, at that time, I was what I was writing was a program to do inverse distance estimation for determining what. Um, uh, or grade would be in a particular block, okay. and then there at that time there was um, uh, I forget what there was the Lurch Grossman concept, and it was like a it was a pit design sort of thing, mm -hmm. and it, they were working on it at the Bureau of Mines at that time. Mm -hmm. So I kind of researched that and tried to understand it. It's a very kind of difficult thing, but. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it was, you know, eventually there were some people that developed some, have developed some real nice software based on that, on those, those techniques. And techniques. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. But at that time it was a two-dimensional thing and, you know, what's optimal in one cross-section uh, is, can be very different from what's optimal, optimal in the next cross-section. So that was the sort of thing we were struggling with mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And now... Um, and then things were done two-dimensionally then. Mm -hmm. Now the um, estimations are done three-dimensionally. Right. So, um, so I was in the two-dimensional world at that time, wishing for a three-dimensional world. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was it, you, people were calling it into being at that point. They were yeah. wishing for it and when, as soon yeah. as the processing power was there. I could see it. Yeah. I could see it happening. But it wasn't there yet. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and in so many fields, like you know, in other fields of biology, you know, being able to image a molecule, that oh, kind of yeah. thing. Right. So you can see the, the, the transition. MRIs. Yeah. MRIs is a very good example because right. those turn into like three dimensional pictures for doctors. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. and so that, that that imaging capability of seeing something in three dimensions and being able to rotate it, is, it sounds like a tremendous tool for the for the mining mm -hmm. industry. As it as it begins to come online and yeah, um, yeah right. you know as what we'll, we're we'll we'll talk our way through it as we migrate our way through your career here yeah because we've been kind of jumping around yeah we have we have <laughs> um, and so you were doing feasibility studies for coal and uranium properties um, that was part of the time uh, at Gulf Mineral Resources yeah right hmm. um, I did some work in coal we actually uh, we were doing more work in uranium. Mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. And they had a project down in uh, Texas called Conquista. And, uh, and I worked on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I did some, some work on that with a geologist who I still know. He lives up in Casper, and we've worked on uranium projects in the last few years oh, cool. as consultants. Right. <laughs> right. So you've, brought, you've, you've kind so, of come back to that area a little bit. Yeah, you never really that, and, that and others. Mm -hmm. You know, I've mm -hmm. just done a lot of different commodities at this point. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that jumped out at me um, during this period is this in the late 70s, early 80s, um, you developed software for economic risk and sensitivity analysis. Risk analysis, yes, yeah, yeah. right. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that and, and how that was, how that work was done? Uh, <laughs> Do we have 10 was, hours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that was kind of like a project sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was, I was just interested in doing something with that because yeah. it's a sort of a statistical thing. Yeah. And, you um, you say you can develop uh, you can develop graphs essentially graphs mm -hmm. um, you know like this is what you know here here's a here's a particular event right and how do we describe that mathematically right so once you describe that mathematically okay that fits in here we design you divide our 
to find something else mathematically that fits in there. So, and then all of that fits into a cash flow. Mm -hmm. So what the risk analysis does is that um, it sort of you go through it and and basically you're saying in this particular iteration, I'm going to pick a random number that represents a point on this either discrete or continuous graph, mm -hmm. and and then run it based on that. And you run a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand of those, and right. you start getting a feel for you know, where your sensitivity points are. Right, right. And get a sense of a range or thresholds yeah. for, for certain right. kinds of activities. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, the simple the simple thing is, well, let's see how it works at 0% at, uh, return. Right. Minus 5, minus plus 5, minus 10, plus 10. But this right. is a lot more, you know, you do more calculations inside. Right. And uh, you can see that processing power is important. Increasing oh, yeah. processing power is important. Oh, when, uh, when I was in, I took a uh, took an economic analysis course, mm -hmm. and when I took it, I didn't really have a computer, so I did all the calculations on on um, big accounting sheet, mm -hmm. and then I learned how to use Excel, and it was like, oh wow, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Actually, it wasn't Excel at the time; it was Notice. Quattro Pro, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. And it was like, oh wow, I love this. You know, and I'd spend a whole afternoon doing one, and here I could do ten in ten minutes. Yeah. Well, this is uh, uh, so. So um, this dovetails into the, the next phase here because you return, if I'm correct, you return to the Colorado School of Mines in the early '80s. Is that right? Oh, I taught there. Yeah. Yeah, for three so and a half you're, years. You were an assistant professor at yeah. the School of Mines. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, can you talk about that transition? And it's it's a brief period, so it's 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 something you tried for a while and then, then moved out of it. Well, um, I got tired of working for Gulf Mineral Resources, okay. also. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and and where was that I, based? Did you have to move? Or I you was in Denver. Denver. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and um, I said. Well, you know, I'd really like to do some consulting work, but I didn't quite know how to get started. So I thought, you know, I considered going to teach because at the School of Mines they encourage encourage professors to do consulting work. So I thought, well, that would be a good transition. Mm -hmm. And um, and I taught there, but I also found out that that wasn't really my best thing either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So then, and the, and but during that time, I started in the software evaluation thing because that was when the early '80s was when these companies were really starting to expand, and um, you know PCs were starting to take off. Right. People, they were lower priced. You could do stuff on your desktop that required big, huge, um, big, huge computer installations. Before that. Mm -hmm. And um, and now engineers could sit at their desks and do some of this work there, and the, the market just expanded like crazy there yeah. in the early '80s. Mm -hmm. And there were also there was also a group called the uh, um, Computer Oriented Geological Society that started up about that time uh -huh. that I was involved in, and, uh -huh. and it was. You know, a bunch of people who you know made, started with a lot of geologists, yeah. and they had uh, these PCs, and there wasn't any geological software, so they were developing their own, mm -hmm. and so that I was kind of part of that uh, that group also, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I did some software development there too, but again, I realized that I'm not the best programmer in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But I really liked using the programs, yeah. so so I kind of that kind of worked into, um, you know, just researching the software that was out there, evaluating it. You know, what's you know what's the real thing? You know, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. And what are what what are all these programs that people are starting to use? So I started a newsletter and a software directory, mm -hmm. and. Um, and wrote articles, and you know there were some, you know the interest in computing for geology and mining was getting more 
uh, mainstream, mm -hmm. a little bit more mainstream. Mm -hmm. But there weren't very many people writing about it, and there weren't very many people consolidating the information. Right. I mean, so, it seems like it was in the history of computing in like the late 70s and the early 80s, it's, it's these very, very kind of cl some closed communities of the, of, of the, the developers themselves. Yeah. And, and, uh, and they were very, very tightly connected. But you were interested in kind of reaching, it sounds like from the lists of papers you were doing in the mid 80s, mm -hmm. that you were a, almost like a bit of a proselytizer. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I said, hey, guys, here's some cool software, and you can do these things with it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, what are you still using a hand calculator for? Right, right, right. Um, and during this time as well, it, during the time that you were, I'm, I'm just interpreting um, this, this, uh, this, this data, um, during the time that you were at the, uh, an assistant professor at the Colorado School of Mines, you did some postgraduate coursework in mineral economics. Right. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about the discipline of mineral economics? How is mineral economics different from mainstream economics? Is it just that it's focused on the mining industry, or do, there's some differences? Well, um, there are differences, yeah. And they, it, it does focus more on commodities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a, in mineral economics, you take the basic, you know, micro, macro economics, but um, when, when you get through the basics, then you start in specific courses, like uh, one of the most well-known courses is Frank Sturmel's, uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's basically an economics course that teaches you how to evaluate mineral properties. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of examples because Mineral properties are not easy to evaluate because it's all, it's all virtual until you actually dig it, and by right. the time you dig it, that, that's done. Yeah. And it's gone. Right, right. So, um, and there are other, you know, they use the same basic economic techniques, mm -hmm. the same cash flow kind of things, but you have to be aware of the um, of the risks and the uncertainties. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I can say well. You know, I think this deposit has this particular grade, but eh. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you don't realize that, you know, well, it may be there and it may not be, then you know, then you can. People have gotten in a lot of trouble. I bet, I bet, yeah. and I guess with that, I mean, part of that is also risk analysis. You're trying to, yeah, you're trying to develop a range of estimates. It could be at the lowest end. The yeah. ore body could be this, and right. the highest end it could be this. And the probabilities. Right. You you work with probabilities. That's uh, geostatistics is very good mm -hmm. with that. So you're saying, you know, that I can, you know, doing these techniques, I can have, and with the data that I have, I can have this degree of confidence right. that this is probably pretty close to what what it really is. Right. And then when you actually get into the mining of it, then, then you go back and compare what you did to you reconcile with the, you know, what you're actually mining with your original model. Right. And then you can adjust your model to, in that same mine, so you can adjust your model so that, uh, so that you get you know, pretty good, um, so you get closer. Right. Right, yeah. it's it's adjusted and in, in, in an iterative process, and it's like a yeah. it's like project management. It sounds like yeah, yeah. Um, that you mm -hmm. have your estimated costs as as you start, and then as you go along, you you make you adjustments. You have to adjust, and yeah. you have right. to yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. um, and so the the taking that coursework, you had questions in your mind that derive from your initial efforts to model mines and model new mines? Is that what you were thinking? Or were you thinking ahead to wanting to consult and you want to have credentials in that area? Right. Some of both. Some of both? Some of both, yeah. yeah. And and so it, I wanted the credentials because I thought that hmm. this would give me uh, some skills to add to my resume um, to get jobs. Mm -hmm. And was mineral, mineral economics at at uh, Colorado School of Mines, was that fairly new as a discipline? Yeah, it, had been around it for was a while? pretty new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back um, then. 
and so this is uh, while you're an assistant professor at the School of the Mines, you, you take this graduate I could take course. one course a semester for no charge. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other motivation. I yeah, suppose, right. right? <laughs> and, and I was interested in it. And, yeah. and I've done a little bit of work as a consultant on mineral commodities and mm -hmm. you know, supply demand sort of things. It sounds like it helped. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. kind of fit part of your your um, repertoire right. of, te of, of techniques. You're interested yeah. in, in estimation, assessment, uh, ongoing assessment, planning. Yeah. And that's, it seems to be all part of that. Right, right. And I'm interested in a lot of different things, mm -hmm. so I didn't particularly want to go and, you know, do mine, pl you know, mine planning at a single mine for the next 30 years. You right, know? right. I like doing different things and having different challenges. Well, speaking of that, that's a good segue. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> so, uh, so th this is right around the time of the, the genesis of, of Gibbs Associates. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about how that came about? And, and uh, obviously, you wanted to strike out on your own. Uh, but um, mm -hmm. uh, what were the ingredients that made that um, an option for you? Well, um... Part of it was I was out there uh, talking to people about uh, computer applications, and I, I was I was getting very familiar with the um, software that was available, and I was starting to write articles about that time. Mm -hmm. So I got to be known as as the person to go to. the The vendors knew me because they said, right. you know, go see Betty, you know, you've got a mining product, go see Betty, and she'll write about your stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so then that led into some consulting jobs for companies like, um, you know, I've done like database, you know, database cleanups for some companies where, mm -hmm. where they just had a bunch of data and they didn't know quite what to do with it, but they needed to get it into some kind of uh, digital format. So mm -hmm. I've done some of that, and I did some um, did some old uranium data. You mm -hmm. know, like the uranium data had been sitting around for thirty years in these old mag magnetic tapes. So, so how do you how do you retrieve that? Because that's thousands of drill holes, yeah. and you know it's expensive to do drilling and. If we can retrieve them from those old tapes, then mm -hmm. that saves us a lot. So you had so, to you had to mount those on on main on an old mainframe. Yeah, well, you had to go around finding somebody who had one of those old tape drives. Right, right. <laughs> and then be able to interpret the data that was on them because you know IBM had its format, Control Data had its format, and so forth. So, mm -hmm. so I did, I didn't do all of it myself, but I uh, I. I found people who had the skills right, to right. do that, and then I would, you know, make interpret the data because I knew what the data should look like and what it meant. Mm -hmm. These computer guys had no clue, but right. they could read it yeah. and give it to me in a digital, in a ASCII format, so yeah. I could do something with it. Yeah. And then I did a lot of uh, evaluation of software for companies because the company would say, "Well, you know, we want to." Put in one of these packages, and the, and not very many companies had them at that time. Mm -hmm. Some did, for sure, uh, but a company would say, you know, I want to know what's the right package because there were like five or six different ones. And right. So I would go to the company and um, look at what they were doing and say, oh, okay, well, let's see. I think you know this package A, B, and C. Would be, you know, would probably be suitable, and mm -hmm. then I would do a, like a comparison of the capabilities, yeah. and I would talk to the users, and and of course I understood how things worked, so that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. It's an enormous. I mean, you you fit. Um, you fulfilled an enormous role in mining at that time because. Mm -hmm. uh, Mining has this problem. You explained that there was 30-year-old uranium data on these mm -hmm. dusty old tapes, um, and that's part of the. Uh, and I'm going. I'm guessing here, but that's part of the the problem of of the industry is that there'll be exploration and development. It then will then lie dormant because the funding doesn't come together. Right. The company gets sold. 
uh, there's a merger, or there are all these kinds of reasons, and the, the market collapses. And then the technology changes. And then the technology changes they, in the interim. Right, and they they don't keep up with transferring that data into other formats. No, because it can because be... Because there's no money for it. Right, or there's no, no institution right. anymore. It's, yeah. they, they have these properties, and it's on the books, but they're not, there's no institutional... The institutional memory is only it's as gone. alive yeah, right. as, yeah. as the, the, the management mm. that says this needs to be constantly updated and constantly translated. Right. Yeah, um, because they didn't have the, you know, the, they, they took these tapes and old printouts and just threw them in a warehouse somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever have any problems with damaged tapes? Yeah. Lost tapes? Yeah. Yeah. There were some, uh, a couple of the projects I worked on were were pretty good yeah. uh, because the magnetic um, media, of course, kind of deteriorates after yeah. a while. It does. Um, and the ones in that project were pretty good, and we were able to um, to get the the data captured. Mm -hmm. But then I worked on another one, and the tapes were okay, but we couldn't decipher the data. Because you have to know something about the format. And, right. and if the guys who make the tapes don't put something on there about what the format looks like, whew, who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. in, in some ways, those, those problems don't go away, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you're, you're in business <laughs> for yeah, the right. foreseeable future. Right. Um, and, and then uh, you know, I have worked on some projects where... They had some stuff on on computer, but then they had all of these old uh, drill holes that were still just on paper, mm -hmm. and so. But now there's a, there are pretty easy ways to digitize that information and get it into a digital format. Mm -hmm. They were they were in were they were in punch card formats? They were no, actually written no, by hand. No, these were drawings. Oh, I see. And uh, hand handwritten logs. Wow. wow. And there are still companies that have that. <laughs> That's astonishing. When you think of I mean, well, some of these. That's these, a small company. Yeah. You know, small companies, especially, they still do. You know, they do a lot of things by hand. Mm -hmm. And properties are, are sometimes a hundred years old. Yeah. And have been worked and reworked and right. abandoned and yep. taken up again. Yep. And it's a it's a real challenge for the mining. Mm -hmm. Uh, mining companies, large and small, to maintain uh, the knowledge of what they have. Oh yeah. Um, right. I don't know if I can confirm this at all. I heard a rumor that that uh, uh, archives and records of of Anaconda Copper, which is one of the largest copper companies in the world, are in somebody's basement. This Some of them are. Yeah. Some of them are also at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, because mm -hmm. I have dug into those. Okay. Yeah. So this is actually relevant to your the work that you've oh, done. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. And definitely, some are still in somebody's basement. And and I know that uh, some of these uranium, some of these uranium uranium properties are still in people's basements. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's work to be done, in other words. Oh yeah. <laughs> right. um, so in 1984, Gibbs Associates starts. Um, mm -hmm. Who who are the associates? Me. Okay. And and whoever else, uh, <laughs> whoever else I can get to yeah. work with me, um, a guy named Steve Krajewski is a person that he and I started out in, like the early '80s, uh, in the and I met him through the uh, Computer Oriented Geological Society (COGS), and you know we did some workshops together and and we maintained a good friendship over the years. Mm -hmm. And we still occasionally will do something together. Right, right. Um, and uh, as um, and processing power really takes off at oh, this time. It's um, wonderful. And so, um, you know, now I think we can venture into talking about 3D modeling and that kind of stuff. So when mm -hmm. does that really become a reality for, for computing in the industry? Mm, well, it was kind of gradual. Um, and probably mid '80s to mid '90s yeah. uh, is when the vendors were really starting to 
you know, really working on developing those 3D capabilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really only in the past 10 years where it's just mushroomed yeah. completely. Yeah. So that, you know, like now I, I have a program that I spent probably, I don't know, $15,000 on, mm -hmm. which does more than what <clears throat> programs in the early 80s would do that would cost 50 or 100,000. Mm -hmm. So some of the early mm -hmm. software um, uh, programs were that expensive? Oh yeah. And so, a couple of them still are. <laughs> right. So, so would you, you know, sell the car to get one of these or, or would you uh, uh, partner with others to share the cost of the software, to share the cost of a license or how would you, those are expensive for yeah, a, a well, single operation. Yeah. Um, there, you know, you, well, things are a little different now because you can actually um, almost rent them by the hour. Yeah. Um, mm. But back then, when I worked on that kind of software, I worked on the company's right. programs right. because they could afford to buy them. Right. Right. Yeah. So you could use them. And, and yeah, and then them. and then I would uh, I was well known in, enough in the vendors that you know I could get d demo versions right. and stuff like that. Right. The people at Rockware um, always. Uh, you know, they always give me a, a license, almost, yeah. you know, I say, hey, Molly, <laughs> <laughs> I got this project, and I'd be glad to pay for the software. Oh, no, you, we don't, you don't owe me anything for the software, and then they give me a license. Oh, nice. And, nice. and that company is called Rock Rockware. Where? Yeah, As they're in... out in Golden. Oh, okay. Yeah, like okay. in, uh, you know, computer software for rocks. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they've always been, you know, like the low-cost, uh, inexpensive geological software. Mm -hmm. They also started out in the early 80s with the PCs, and, and Jim Reed was uh, one of the founders of the COGS group mm -hmm. also. And, and they've developed, you know, and they, they were actually a fairly early adopter of three-dimensional things. Mm -hmm. And again, they three-dimensional images, and they got software, you know, some graphical software and incorporated right. in, into their system. Did they have to use, I know uh, early 90s, this is like C-graph machines, did they have to use special uh, PCs that were souped up? Um, kind of I don't remember like exactly graphics, when it changed, but as mm -hmm. PCs got more capable than, <clears throat> early on, yeah, you had to have a souped up computer Yeah, yeah. for that. But then, then the technology kept progressing mm. and you don't you know you don't have to have a special computer anymore yeah you do it is good to have like um, more more memory and yeah. you know good graphics capabilities but now things work on just about any graphics right. thing <laughs> and you know we have eight gigabytes and a little flash drive yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, you know and almost a terabyte of, uh, of memory and but and I don't remember the exact dates but it was in the 90s probably yeah. Yeah. that that the personal computing power got got strong enough to actually run some of the bigger programs mm -hmm. and so you'd be in a position to know uh, the kind of geography for mining software in the United States and maybe in, in the world. In the world. Um, yeah, it's a worldwide it's thing. It's a worldwide thing. So yeah. was Denver a major epicenter for this kind of thing? Or, or you know, was it was it there, stuff that was being adapted from Silicon Valley or MIT? Is it? No, not so much. Yeah. Uh, the people that were developing the software were writing stuff from scratch. Yeah. You know, like the uh, Mintech people, they're based in Tucson. There were several companies in Denver that were developing stuff, um, a couple in Canada mm -hmm. and Australia. Mm. And, oh, and there was one based out of England. Right. So, so there were these kind of centers of yeah. mining software development. Yeah. So 
two large mining states in the United States produce this, and two large mining countries, Canada and uh, Australia. Yeah, Australia yeah. And England. Is and then England <laughs> has, well, they're all over. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's fascinating. So, uh, so you continue to do uh, data rescue and conversion. That was something you've been doing from mm -hmm. the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and or reserves. And or reserves. Yeah. In right. other words, the uh, you know, calculate or determining the ore body models. Right. Well, the, yeah, geological modeling. Geological yeah. modeling. Um, yeah. And GIS mapping. So. Yeah, I dabbled in that okay. for a while. Uh huh. And um, it it has some use in the mining industry, mm -hmm. but it's more it's very useful for environmental stuff. Yeah. Because uh, you you can basically build layers of information. Right. So you'd have a wildlife layer, you'd have a plant layer, you'd have a a water layer, and so forth. Right. And so and it's there, discrete, and you can layer them on top. Yeah. Of each other. Right. right. And there are some mining companies that use GIS. Mm. So I dabbled in that. So I've dabbled in this. Dabbled in that. <laughs> um. <clears throat> and uh, since 2006, you, or maybe I may be misinterpreting this, maybe just in 2006, but it looks like since 2006, you've been uh, also consulting for a consulting company? Yeah, well, with Barry Dolbear. Yeah. And I'm an associate, a senior associate mm -hmm. with them. And their, their model is they have a few people that are salaried, yeah. and then they hire associates depending on the job. So right. So I would I get a job from them, and they say, okay, you're going to team with these three or four other people, mm -hmm. and you go out to these properties, and we do different things, you yeah. know, like yeah. um, like every year we do an audit of a particular mine, right? And <clears throat> so we go up, and I, you know, I'm the ore reserves person, and so I kind of look at what they're doing that way, and 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 I get uh, also the nice thing about that is I also get to hear all the rest of it too. Mm -hmm. So it's um, it's a very broad based sort of thing. But I, and I'm working with teams yeah. almost always. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, it sounds like what motivates you in part is that you need you need things to be different. Yeah. You need to change up. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like routine. Yeah. Uh, and consulting <laughs> gives you that. You know you can. Just, Come in. There's a big mess somewhere, and you can clean it up, and move on to the next thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've done that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, I go in and I, oh, this is awful. You, know? <laughs> you can't use this data. You're using five different names for the same thing, and mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the that you sort know, of thing. The discipline of protocols. It's uh, mm -hmm. something. Something in my well, yeah, uh, like in this hundred-year-old mind that I. Did some work for well, they changed how they did things over the years, yeah. and they didn't go back and really clean things up. Yeah, that requires so. some sleuthing. You have to sort of identify at what point it changes. You have to go through the you sample, I imagine, <coughs> at different years, and then you say, okay, now it's different, and you have to go back and find when it changed, and then incorporate that yeah, parameter into the series. Sort of, yeah, you know, but. When I when I put it, this stuff in a database, then um, <clears throat> then I oh I don't know it's pretty simple. You just kind of sort on the on the formation name and yeah. okay, what's this one? What's that one? And sometimes they know and sometimes they don't. Right. And so sometimes you have to kind of just put things as a big question mark and right. and oh this is all scene three. Right. Okay, but here's another way that they said the same thing. Right. And so a lot sometimes it's just, you know, doing visual checks because mm -hmm. you can't always write routines to to find things. If mm -hmm. you don't know what you're looking for, you can't write a routine to find it. Right, right. Yeah. And so that's what you that's what people call cleaning yeah. the data. You have right. to clean up the data so that it's yeah. consistent. And I have an eye for it. Yeah. You know, because I can take a sheet like this. If there's a an error anywhere, I go right to it. <laughs> you just kind of scan almost with peripheral vision. No, I don't know what I do, but <laughs> <laughs> I really don't. Right, right. But I'll, and this even happened with a lawyer one time. 
<laughs> and he was just flabbergasted because, you know, and, and I hadn't looked at it for more than a couple minutes. And I said, oh, there's a spelling error there. <laughs> Right. Typo. You see something that just doesn't fit. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, Maybe like that's because a... I do so much reading. Yeah. 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 So it's not something that's not something that I control. Right. Right. It's just it part just of your. Uh, yeah. It's part of the repertoire yeah. that you've developed from training. You've trained your mind. You've had an aptitude, mm -hmm. I'm sure. And then you've trained your mind to work in certain ways. And so at this point, I think certain stuff is automatic. Right. But when you say train my mind, I didn't do it consciously. No, sure I didn't not. sit yeah. down and say, okay, I'm going to learn how to do this. Yeah. It's yeah. like it just developed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the, yeah. In the course of doing work, mm -hmm. I think, you know, you've got a time constraint. You're working, you know, late on something and you're just hitting that, that activity over mm -hmm. and over again. Your brain adapts to that activity. And before you know it, it's kind of automatic, and, and yeah, you can, right. You can ex you excel at that just because of, of repetition and yeah, and effort. Just happened. There you go. <laughs> yeah. um, Sometimes I think my whole life just happened. <laughs> <laughs> people have made references to fate and things mm -hmm. like that, um, but there's there's other pieces to to your career. Um, there's service. You've done you've mm -hmm. done service to the profession, and you've done other kinds of service as well. Can you talk a little bit about the United Nations stuff? Oh, right. Those yeah. were fun jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what happened there? Well, I knew this guy, and I had known him because he was uh, he was part of a company in Canada that I don't they didn't develop software, but they did consulting using software or something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he. I knew him from all of this activity with the evaluation stuff. Mm -hmm. So he went to work for the United Nations. And then he said he was working on getting computer applications in country, various countries around the world in mm -hmm. developing countries. And would I be interested in um, you know, making proposals to go and, uh, and help these people get started with computer applications? So. I did, mm -hmm. and I did. <laughs> and uh, so I went to a bunch of African countries mm -hmm. and China once. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this a part of, of a travel inclination, or is that? I love the... to travel. Okay. Yes. So. Um, Which is partly why I thought mining would be a good career because I could travel. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and so, mm -hmm. have you done consulting in other countries, or do you just like to take a big long trip sometimes? Well, most of my travel has been uh, been doing consulting work in other countries. Yeah. Um, in the past few years, I've started just taking trips. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> so. And uh, so, South America, Canada. Um, well, my husband and I went to uh, Scotland last fall, mm -hmm. and um, several years ago, I went on a trip. Well, actually, no. In about 1998, mm -hmm. I went on a trip with some uh, Gibbs family, mm -hmm. and we had a Gibbs family tour of southern England because that's where the Gibbses eventually or originally came from. Mm -hmm. And so I met a guy there named George Gibbs, and he was having an 80th birthday a few years ago, so I said, I'm going to go to his 80th birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Um, so, but it, before that, I didn't have the money to yeah, do that. Yeah. So, most of my trips were paid for by somebody else. Right, right. And which is great. I yeah. mean, it's a great way to travel. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, when were you in China? That's probably early '90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you were doing basically kind of database consulting and no, modeling. well, it was again um, computer application right. training. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. they they were using computers pretty well then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, so I was I did some geostatistics work with them, mm -hmm. and I took along a lot of um, like public domain software, right. open source. We call it open source now, but it was public domain. Right. And because they were interested in developing some things, but you know they have such a huge country that they can't afford to buy a thousand data mines. Right. You know, they, right. So, so they 
wanted to know what the technology was and you know what these programs could do so that they could develop it themselves. Right. And uh, and also you went to Kenya. Is that right, Kenya? Uh, no, it was um, uh, Malawi. Okay. Tanzania, mm -hmm. uh, Ethiopia, and Ghana. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And what, what years, roughly, were you doing that time? That time? was mid-80s to mid-90s. Mm -hmm. I loved it. I bet. I bet. <laughs> it and was great. Yeah. yeah. What were some of the, some of the uh, most fascinating aspects of that, uh, of that consulting work? Well, the African people are different. Because, and, and I realized this because I was doing some training, you know, some of it was just basic, this is how you use a PC. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it took me, it didn't take me too long to realize that, you know, they're, in their cultures, they learn things by rote. Mm. Because they don't have very many books, they don't, you know, they, paper is, is a valuable commodity. Yeah. So the te and I saw this in several places where I was. The teacher will, would say blah blah blah. The students would say blah blah blah. Right. So they learned a lot of things by rote, mm -hmm. and and I realized that you know, some of why they couldn't understand certain concepts about how to use a computer was that they didn't really understand the variable. Mm -hmm. you know, things had to be, you know, if you want to find a, a document that's xyz.doc, then you look for xyz.doc. You don't look for, or, and they didn't quite get that you could use an asterisk for the xyz part. Right, right. So that was a very interesting uh, revelation for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. And so you had to key or to make, make changes in your pedagogy in order to yeah. reach them a bit better. Or, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So. So that was a challenge. And you've had service to um, uh, the mining uh, associations as well. So you received the uh, SME Distinguished Service Award. When was that? Well, that was, boy, that must have been in the 90s mm -hmm. sometime. And that was, that was because of all of the, uh, the work that I had done on uh, making the industry more aware of the capability of computing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what that was about. Great, great. So you were recognized so, for that. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't seek it out. It's just right. you know this guy did it. Mm -hmm. You know. And but you were a member of the SME. I've been a member of SME for over fifty years. Yeah. Because I started in 1960 when I was a student. Mm -hmm. They consider that, and I stayed a member the whole time. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> it is <laughs> totally amazing. It is. It's like, how did that happen? <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, uh, the one of the other imp important associations is the Mining and Metallurgical Society of America. Right. And you're the executive director since since 2008. Since 2008. And yeah. how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> that's another interesting story. Uh, yeah, uh, see, I think I was I was uh, invited to join in 1993, mm -hmm. so I became a member of MMSA in 1993, and I happened to go to one of the annual meetings one time because they we do our annual meetings during SME, mm -hmm. and I went to the annual meeting one time and they were talking about website, and I had been uh, doing website work for. Mineral Information Institute, mm -hmm. so I kind of stuck my head in, you know, spoke up and said, "Oh, I can help with that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was doing that for I don't I don't even remember what years, but anyway, I was doing that for uh, for some years, and then the executive director and oh, and then I would uh, say because I said well, you know, I, I really ought to sit in on the executive committee meetings so that I get an idea of what's going on right. so, that, so that I can, uh, you know, do the right kind of thing for the web page. So, uh, so when the previous executive director retired, then they asked me if I would do it mm -hmm. because I was already kind of 
clued in to yeah. how things worked. Right, you know? exactly. And, um, and I'm still learning. <laughs> <that's right. laughs> it's, yeah. It seems to be, uh, um, the, the society seemed to be an important um, social and uh, I guess cultural glue for the industries. Uh, yeah. that, that, Brings people together. It allows yeah. people to network, and right. and it seems to be a pretty tight community. It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I want to thank you for taking the time. We're running out of time here, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sure. Um, but I've been uh, babbling. On. No, no. This has been really, uh, really fascinating, and we don't have the story yet about. There's, I think, more to be done on the history of computing. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, and I'd be in glad to help. However, that would be great. That would be great. Yeah. Um, so um, well, we'll talk more. And um, thank you very much for for sitting down to talk with the Oral History Center. Yeah, thank okay. you.